Let me invite you this morning to turn in your Bibles to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2, that's over there towards the end of the New Testament. If you get to the um, index pages there, you've gone too far. Titus chapter 2. And uh, this morning our topic is about being on fire for God. About being a people that are fired up over what God is doing in their hearts and doing in their lives about being a church that's fired up, about what God's doing in the life of the church, about being on fire in such a way that we cannot help but be contagious as we go out into all the world and share a bit of who we are in Christ Jesus. In Titus chapter 2, verse 11, the scripture says this, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. These things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority. Let no one disregard you. You know, there's nothing that's greater, it seems, than to come into a a large gathering of followers of Christ who are worshiping the Lord, who are celebrating the Lord, who are singing these songs that, that talk about our freedom and about our chains being taken away, that sing heartfelt words that speak to the depths of our being. Then we hear some inspirational speaker and we get motivated and we go out But yet, the wind then goes out of our sail. And what God desires among us is Paul writes these words that we are to speak and exhort and reprove with all authority, that these words are to be lived in such a way that that our lives are not just about a great group gathering on Sunday morning, but it's about walking with the Lord Monday through Saturday. Those times at points where we're alone and by ourselves and, and, and those other times when we're with a smaller group of people and even in our own family. He tells us in verses 13 and 14 that Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. And as you dig into this scripture, it, it seems like then that the Lord is speaking about work. And as you think about the topic of work and you compare it to the rest of what the Bible has to say, this is what you discover. You discover that one of the main purposes in life is that of work. It's that of work. So just think about this. If you're a high school student or you're a college student, you better be enjoying these days because there's coming a day that you're going to have to work to get your pay. There's coming that day when when you're going to have to clock in from 9 to 5 or 6 to 5 or whatever else that's going to be. But the Bible tells us that work was made for us because it's out of the work of our lives that, that that we are developed and that joy is brought to us. It's God's divine arrangement. Now, when it comes to the topic of work, the Bible says there are three kinds of work that we involve ourselves in. Have you ever thought about that? Three kinds of work. The very first kind of work that we involve ourselves in is what we call dead works. The writer of the Hebrews uh, referred to this uh, uh, when he said it's the blood of Jesus Christ that can cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So dead works happen when, when we're living without Jesus Christ in our life. You know, we're just going along and we're saying, well, I don't see a need to to bow the knee and invite Christ into my heart and invite Christ in my life. I mean, I am a good person, right? How many times have you heard that? I'm a good person. I do good things for, for people. I even do good things for people who act badly. I don't think bad things. I think good things. But the Bible says that any kind of thing that we have to offer like that, stands as a dead work before God because the only thing that brings our works to life is Jesus Christ living in and through us. The Bible says that our most perfect moment of righteousness stands as filthy rags before God without Jesus Christ living in me, without him being the Lord of my life. 
And so we have dead works. It's the product of the natural man without Jesus Christ. But the second kind of work that we have is the work that we'd call bad works. And these bad works are the product of our carnal man. Now, the difference between our natural man and our carnal man is this, is I've been saved by the grace of Almighty God. I've been brought into his family. I am his child. But as his child, I sometimes act badly. Do your children ever act badly? How many of you have a child that's never done anything wrong? I see a couple of you pointing to your parents saying, come on, lift your hand, don't be ashamed. But you've never done anything wrong. But yet Paul wrote and said, we must all first appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So bad works are the product of our carnal man. And this is what the Bible has to say. It says that one day when we appear before the Bible, the judgment seat of Christ, uh, we're going to be judged by fire. And these works are made out of uh, hay and wood and, and, and straw. These things are going to be burned up and burned away. So what are those kinds of works? Those are the kinds of works that we really didn't do for the kingdom. We might have done it for our own vain glory. We may have done it for some other purpose, but it really doesn't matter in the eyes of Christ because the other works that matter in the eyes of Christ are the works that we call good works. Paul says to the Ephesians in chapter 2, verse 10, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And so these good works are equated to the things that last, of like gold and silver and, and precious stones. Though tested by fire, they remain. These are the things that we do for the glory and the honor of God. These are the things that we do when no one else is watching. These are the things that we invest our lives in when no one else will know. These are the things that, that really matter because they come out of the heart where Christ Jesus lives and makes us alive. And so when I look at this scripture teaching here, this is what I begin to understand. I begin to understand then that this work that God has called me to is, is something that I'm supposed to be fired up about. I'm supposed to be excited about. As a matter of fact, the term that the Bible uses here is the term zealous. I am to be zealous for the work of God. That word zealous means to be on fire. It means to be boiling. It means to be boiling over. And you know, every once in a while in a Baptist church, you get somebody that comes in, and man, they're boiling over. They're, they're the, doing the hoops and the hoorays for Jesus. And other people look and think, well, man, that's a little bit abnormal. But the problem is, is most of us as followers of Jesus Christ, that, uh, that, that we act so uh, abnormally that when we see someone who is normal in Christ, we think they're weird. And here's the deal. We're supposed to boil up. We're supposed to boil over. We're supposed to, to be on fire for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, how does that happen? And how does it bring, come about in our, in our lives? Well, they come, the, these works, in order to be able to boil and to, and to be on fire for the Lord, it doesn't come because I'm mustered up inside because, you know, I can sit there and muster and muster and muster and muster. And you know what's in me just doesn't really want to respond. So these things come from the grace of God. God's grace reaches in and it touches me. His grace is his unmerited favor. His, fa his grace brings glory to his name. And in his unmerited favor, he brings glory to his name as he brings it to work in my life by, first of all, setting the captive free. Grace sets you free. It liberates you. In Titus chapter 2, verse number 11 of our text, the Bible says, For the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation to all men. And so this saving grace, this liberating grace, this setting free grace of God is personalized because this is how he does it. He does it because he's the Savior who redeems. Jesus Christ didn't like just any other Savior in the world, but he is the Savior who redeems. It says in verses 13 and 14 of the text, our, God, our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed. So Jesus Christ has given himself to save us. 
and to redeem us from every lawless deed. Now, part of that means that, okay, part of that is that I'm going to go to heaven one day. I'm going to be in God's glory forever and ever one day. You know, that's all cool and great. But, you know, when you're like Mike and you're laying on the table waiting to die for three hours, it's not seeming all that great at that very moment because we've got this instinct inside of us that says, I want to live. I want to survive. You know, I want to I wanna see my grandkids, give my kids the problems my kids gave me. We, we go through this stuff. And here's the deal. Those good works that are in us, part of that purpose in that redemption thing then is not just to carry us to heaven, but part of that thing in this whole idea of redemption is that, that we would be redeemed to do those things that are good, to do those things that are right. Paul's telling us here that the price Jesus Christ paid on Calvary's cross was in order that we might be liberated, that we might be set free from the slave market of sin. That, my, that song we sang a little while ago, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound, but we get to those new words, my chains are gone, I've been set free. You know, part of that whole redemption is to set us free so that we don't have to be held back and held down and pulled under and, and, and overwhelmed and beaten over because Christ has come to set us free. A missionary from Africa told a story about many years ago. There was a young warrior that wanted to marry a, 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 a Chowaki girl that he found very beautiful and, and he had fallen in love with her. But there was one problem. She was a slave to a powerful Angolan chief. And he went to the chief. He mustered up the courage, you know, to, to go to the chief and ask the permission of the chief to marry this girl. And the chief gave him this exorbitant dowry that would be required in order to have that girl set free in order for him to marry her. He knew there's no way that, that he could ever come up with that kind of a dowry to pay the chief. And so he came up with an idea that maybe if he presented himself to the Achawaki chief as a slave himself, the chief would give him permission to marry the girl. And the chief granted his wish. The missionary said, you know, upon hearing about this, I wondered, you know, what it was that would possess a man to give up his freedom in order to set another free not even knowing for certain that she would say yes. And the missionary talked to this young girl who became the bride. She did say yes. He said, why do you think he did that? And her words were so simple. He did it because he loved me. He did it because he loved me. You know, why did, why did Jesus come to earth? and give up his freedom and his authority in heaven and his comfort in heaven to basically become a slave on this planet. He did it because he loved me. He did it because he loved you. He has chosen to love us. You know, we don't have a God who's vengeful and hateful and, and waiting in heaven to zap us for any wrong thing that we ever do. We have a God in heaven who, who indescribably loves us, who's indescribably for us, who indescribably wants to see us make it and wants to see us walk in the blessing of his glory, and wants to see us walk in the radiant brightness of his Son, who wants to see us in this life be able to accomplish those things that are good and not be held back and held down and held in the slave market of iniquity and sin and never being able to go forward. So the Lord effects the work in us by the redeeming Savior. But this redeeming Savior not only redeems us, but he releases us. He releases us. And in that process, we are, we're, made, uh, we're made to be uh, released for his glory. He says, our great God and Savior, in verse 13 and 14, Christ Jesus, who gave himself to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify him for himself. Uh, and and in, I put it in the parentheses there because that word is important to grab a hold of. So it's not in your New American Standard if that's what you're using. 
This is in Pastor Steve's standard. Special. Special because that's part of what that Greek word brings out is the special nature of our relationship with the Lord. And you know, we all walk in special relationships with somebody, do we not? You know, we walk in special relationships as husbands and wives, as parents and children, children and parents. We walk in special relationships as friends and as brothers and, and as sisters. But Jesus was involved in redeeming us, and then he was involved in, in releasing us to be a special people. And, and that's highly significant. It carries with it the thought uh, of, uh, of setting a, pe a special people apart for his own possession. And certainly Paul had to be remembering this. Remember, he was educated at the feet of Gamaliel. You know, Paul was a, a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was of the tribe of David. He was circumcised on the eighth day. As to the law, he was a Pharisee. You know, this guy, he had it together. He could have, he, he could have pastored any Baptist church because he had it so together. And he had a zeal for that. He had it all together. But then Paul, he brings our attention then, just because of his knowledge of the Old Testament, all the way back to the Old, where God set the ancient Hebrew people free from Egypt to be his own, and the Scripture says they're his own special uh, uh, possession. Exodus 19.5 says, You shall be my own possession among all the peoples. We've been separated. Although we're separated, though, we're not to live secluded. Now, a little bit of seclusion is, is nice, is it not? You know, last Sunday afternoon, I was dreading. I had a trip to make to Orlando, and I was dreading it immensely bad. I just didn't want to drive 423 miles to, to a meeting that I was having on Monday and Tuesday. But, you know, I forced myself. Y'all gave me a wonderful birthday, by the way. It was great. And, uh, you know, we had cake. And, Deacons, I appreciate the gift you gave me. And, and uh, I appreciate that cake y'all sent home with me with the chocolate-covered strawberries and, and all that, you know. And, and I noticed my belt was a little bit more snug this morning. But, um, you know, it was great. But I, I forced myself. I got in my car, and I drove to Orlando, and I checked in at the Hyatt, uh, at the Hyatt uh, place uh, where we were staying. And, and I made sure that I'd been given the special group code for the, the group I was meeting with at, at a, you know, a discounted rate and made sure that the non-taxable things showed up there because I was checking in on business from the church and everything was fine and good. So I, I lay down, you know, and I'm having a little bit of trouble going to sleep. You know, the bed's not my bed and the pillows aren't my pillows. You ever get like that? You know, and I'm laid there. About 1 o'clock, the phone rings and says, um, Mr. Davies, which Mr. Davies are you? And I said, I'm Stephen Davies. And, and he says, oh, we put you in the wrong room. Don't worry, you don't have to get out of bed. We'll just put this other Davies in another room. And I'm thinking, man, you really don't know what I was thinking? You're an idiot, <laughs> right? Y'all remember that. It's important that I was thinking, man, you're an idiot. Morning comes after I've finally fallen asleep around 4 a.m. You know, it comes way too quick, and I jump up and get dressed to go out to the meeting, get to the church, and, man, there's nothing going on. There's nobody around. I mean, it was President's Day holiday, right? So I start texting out, and I start sending emails from my smartphone, and nobody answers, and I make a phone call, and nobody answers, and then a friend of mine, he finally answers uh, a text. His name's Cliff Lee. He says, hey, Steve, um, I was confused. I thought we were meeting today as well. That email did not start out right. He said, actually, my secretary discovered as she was going through the reservation process that we met last Monday. I felt like the idiot at this point. I was angry at myself. I, this is what I thought when I called my wife as I'm leaving Orlando. I have wasted the last two years of this year of my life driving. But here's the deal. This, release, this release, releasing Savior, he gave me some seclusion in a sense. You know, I, I, I call it windshield time, and windshield time's always good, although we're not fully disconnected because we're a very connected people, right? As, a, as a, for instance, I've got my iPhone right here in my pocket. 
I texted Melanie upstairs a few moments ago while Kyron was singing to get a piece of information from her. And uh, I got that piece of information from her. She sent it to me. I know what, what she has said and all that kind of a stuff. But, you know, to get disconnected and to get secluded sometimes is really good. How many of you would like to have no phone, no internet, no email, no nothing, maybe just for three or four days? Could you go with that? Wouldn't that be great? But after three or four days, wouldn't you be going crazy because you need somebody? So after I got over the idiot moment, I enjoyed the drive back home to be back around the family and the food that my wife would cook and all that kind of stuff. But that grace of God releases us to be a, a, a special people unto God, not a secluded people. And what that grace of God then does that liberates us, that sets us free, that shows us how to live, that grace of God uh, um, completely shows me how to live. And, and what the Lord is telling me right here, and I'm going to go through this quickly, verses 11 and 12, the grace of God has appeared instructing, teaching us, educating us to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. And then in verse 12 he says, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires. This grace of God, it teaches us that we have an old life to live. Listen, when you get saved, when you get saved, things are different. Things have changed. I was just talking to Cameron upstairs a few moments ago, and he was telling me about this journey that he's been on in his life. Like I said, I've known Cameron a long, long, long time, but, but he told me that since he gave his heart to the Lord, that he's even changed the music that he's listening to. And you know, that happens. I remember when I turned back to the Lord as a 22-year-old on my way to California, I'm sitting along there singing with Nitty Gritty Dirt Band and uh, Loggins and Messina and all those good old bands, you know, and I changed every damn in the song to a darn. But there's a change that comes about. And this is what Paul's talking about. He says, because this change, because Jesus Christ has entered into your heart and redeemed you, He's redeemed you from sin and from the slave market of sin, and he's released you to be a special people, to live unto him and bring glory unto his name. He now instructs us, and he teaches us how to live. And the very first instruction is, you got to leave what is behind. you got to leave it behind you. I read somebody's quote the other day, and it said this. It said, don't look behind because that's not the way you're going. We're looking ahead. We're moving forward. And John wrote in 1 John 2, 16, he says, you know, we're to leave this worldliness behind. He says, for all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but it's from the world. In this everyday life, this, this lust of the flesh is those carnal perversions, those appetites and desires, those perverse and misdirected thoughts, and, and they, have a, they, they lead us to unholy things, and, and they're, they're harmful to us. And there are carnal distractions, the, the lust of the eyes, those things that sparkle and attract and seduce and allure. In and of themselves, they may not be bad, but we allow them to, to separate us from that love that God has for us. And then there are those carnal ambitions, that boastful pride of life. You know, it's that assertive ego. It's that assertive ego that, that, that comes out of the womb saying, Wah! It's about me. It's about me. And don't we do that all through our lives? I mean, as babies, we may not be conscious of it, but somewhere along in our adulthood, when we stomp our feet, we're saying, it's about me. I deserve, I want, I desire. It's about me. And so Paul tells us that, that, that those are the kinds of things we leave behind. John says these are the things uh, that are, are, are identified. And then Paul goes back and says, therefore, we live a new life. He instructs us to live, in verse 12, sensibly and righteously and godly. You know what it means to live sensibly? It means that I live in a relationship with myself this is about the relationship with me and my ego that has self-control. Self-control. 
And you know, a lot of people are spiraling out of self-control. They're, they're in a, a desperate uh, direction of a crash. And we all need self-control. I remember after I'd gotten out of the Air Force and was attending college, I'd get out of class about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and, you know, I said, well, I'm ready to eat. I hadn't had breakfast or lunch. And every afternoon I'd stop at Burger King because it was there by my apartment. And I'd get a Whopper, no onions, because raw onions are of the devil. <laughs> and a large fry and a large chocolate milkshake and, um, I don't know, maybe even a fish sandwich without tartar sauce because it's a cl close uh, kin to an onion to me. And you know what? I started putting on weight. As a matter of fact, I go back and look at those pictures when I was a student pastor in that day. I don't want to see them because I wasn't exercising self-control. And when I recognize, man, what happened to that military physique, it's gone terrible. <laughs> it was a freshman 40. I began to exercise self-control and begin to run and all that. And that's what to live sensibly means. It's, and I'm just not talking about the physical self, but to live in self-control in every aspect of my life. But he says we live righteously, and that has to do with my relationships with other people. The way I relate with the family of God, the way I relate with those outside that family. And you know, we live in a world that's, uh, that is filled with hate and antagonism and divisions. You know, take for example, Tim Tebow, a great evangelical Christian football player. It doesn't matter if Tim bows on his knees on the football field. There's antagonism that comes. And, and every comedian out there on Saturday Night Live does the Tebow, right? And people make fun of the Tebow. If Tebow turns down an opportunity to speak, the liberal media jump all over that, and there's been an open declared war on those of faith and those uh, serving the Lord Jesus Christ. This past week, Tim Tebow backed out of a speaking engagement at First Baptist Church of Dallas, Texas, one of the great churches in the country. And you know what? From either perspective, the young man is being attacked. A friend of mine by the name of Jimmy Scroggins, he's the pastor at First Baptist Church, of West Palm Beach said, give him a break. You know, just type in that name on Google, Jimmy Scroggins, Tim Tebow. But in the Florida Baptist Witness, our state newspaper, there's a, a great article there. You know, he just backed out because he didn't want to draw any attention to himself in the midst of the church dedicating a new building because the pastor there has been very outspoken on some issues in our time. But, you know, it's, it's how we, we live in that kind of antagonistic world. And, and that world, you know, it says tolerance. I, I, I notice around here a lot, there are these bumper stickers that say coexist. And it has the symbol of every major religion on that bumper sticker spelling out coexist. But they really don't want to coexist unless you'll be quiet and shut up as a follower of Jesus Christ. You cannot have an, an opinion because the moment that you have an opinion that even is based upon the Scripture, you have become immediately intolerant. And so we live in a world, you know, where husbands and wives oftentimes don't get along. As a matter of fact, some of you may have uh, had intense fellowship this morning on the way to church. And when you got out of the car, you gave that last little dirty look, and then you put the smile on your face, and you've come in here, and you've worshipped Jesus. But you're going to get back to it as soon as church is over. Or some parents and their children have not gotten along. And at 16, you're looking at your mom and your dad, and you're saying, you're the biggest dummies the world's ever seen. You don't understand. You don't know what I'm going through. You don't know what I feel. You don't know what it feels like to be 16. Listen, they're not that old yet. They can still remember when they were 16 and when they were making that argument with their parents. You know, employees and employers don't get along. Neighbors don't get along. You know, we live in a world that's not learned how to get along. But the Lord here tells us that we're to live righteously. We're to set things right and at ease with our neighbor as much as possible, as much as it lies within us, and then to live godly. 
And this is our relationship with God. And in that relationship with God, living godly, it means that I understand that the supreme reason that the Lord Jesus Christ came in this world and died on Calvary on that cross was that you and I could become like God. As a matter of fact, God in his word said that Jesus Christ is the firstborn among many brethren. God's intention is for you and I to be a mirror image of Jesus Christ. But then I ask myself this question. I ask myself this question. As a mirror image of Jesus Christ, is there a flame that burns in me that is on fire for the Lord? This word zealous, you know, uh, uh, talks about our, our spiritual fervency. And when God has, has taken us and set us free and when he's instructed us in how to live, he then places us in action. And you know, wherever you may be today is the place where God has placed you to be in action. Anybody have a job they don't like? You don't have to raise your hand. But that is the place of action for you. Maybe you're at home with the kids. That's the place of action for you. Maybe, you know, it's, it's some wonderful job, and that's God's place of action today. But he may say, you know, as he told Mike, you know, I'm tired of you writing scripts for Saturday Night Live and Letterman and doing all those performances. I'm ready for you to perform for me in a place like Dominican Republic where sometimes it can be hot and sweaty and dirty and smelly and where the poverty can overrun you. But it's learning to be put into action wherever God has us. Because, see, we all have a purpose. Now, I can't sing like Kyron. I don't think Kyron can preach as I do. You know, Dan has a special way of, last Sunday when he baptized, he just lit me up. I enjoyed it so much, he delivered an entire gospel message in five minutes. You know, there are people like uh, Casey Zimmerman back there on the, on the camera to my right. Y'all see Casey? He serves in the Army. Just finished EOD school. This is his last Sunday with us. He's being shipped out to Fort Riley, Kansas. He and his wife and their, their child and their child that's on the way. But there he is faithfully serving. And what I'm just trying to say is this, is God has a place and a purpose for every one of us, no matter where we are no matter where we are he's gifted us to do things that only we can do this term zealous um, it comes out of the Greek and it means boiling or boiling hot to flame up and, and Jesus was he was characterized with that kind of a zeal Apollos in the New Testament was characterized with, with that kind of a zeal you know he was mighty in the scriptures the Bible says being fervent in spirit and powerfully refuted those Jews in public the Apostle John uh, tells, uh, tells us of one of the great complaints concerning the church of Laodicea was this. It was a church that had lost its zeal. Is there ever a time in your life when you were more fervent and zealous than you are today? Is there ever a time in the life of this church when we were more fervent and zealous than we are today? If so... We're guilty of the very sin that the Laodicean, Laodicean church was guilty of, the sin of being lukewarm. Jesus says that nauseates him. That's what the scripture says. And he will spew us out of his mouth. So the call of God is the call to be on We used to sing a song here. Previous worship pastor wrote it, Matt. It's called, God Has Only Started. Any of y'all remember that song? Bob Browning wrote it. God has only started. Yes, he's only started. God has only started. Let him start. And y'all remember that? Anybody? And we had, this, we had this dumb building campaign slogan. It was called flame, uh, Fan the Flame that went along with that song. We're getting ready to build Building 6 at that time. 
And uh, we had an awesome goal, and we had an awesome er goal, and we had an awesome est goal. And, you know, we knew it was bad English, and we knew the song was corny. But this is one thing we knew, is that we were a bunch of people who were fired up for Jesus Christ. Every Sunday, people would get stuck in the sand, packing them in to worship in that little worship building down there. The altars would fill. When the choir finished singing, people would go up and fill the choir loft to have a place to sit. Can I challenge you, church, that God wants to see his church with that kind of a zeal and with that kind of a fire once again. But that zeal and that fire, it starts in you. If you've ever been closer to the Lord than you are right now, you're in a place where you need revival. And in this song of decision, I'm going to invite you just to make your way to the altar on either side. And come and say, Lord Jesus, do it again. Do a work in me. Set my soul ablaze, dear Lord. For some of you, you've never trusted the Lord to be your Savior. And this is the day. You've spirit, you feel the Spirit knocking. Cameron said, he said, Pastor, I listened to you preach for years but I never made the turn. And then God got a hold of you. Listen, God is speaking to your heart today. You don't have to wait to see a video, but he's drawing some of you to the foot of the cross. Would you come today? Some of you for the simple step of obedience to be baptized. You come. Let's pray. Father, we bring you honor and glory and praise. And we thank you for the power of the cross that's in our lives. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have set us free. We thank you that you teach us how to live. And we thank you that you send us out into service. Lord, help us not to be lukewarm. Help us not to be mediocre. But Lord, help us to rise with spiritual fervency and zeal in following after you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand with